Welcome back. And now we're going to start talking about some of the different medications that we can use and how we might actually determine which of the drugs is most appropriate for our patients. Now, there's going to be a lot of information in the next um, several sections related to all the different medications that, um, that we could potentially see. There is an entire section that we will not be testing on right away. And then I will give you also, in, um, in order to kind of keep some of this straight, a cheat sheet that has the drugs that I want you to know and um, to kind of go from there. But of course, if there are questions or concerns, please feel free to give me a call or to email me um, and we will hopefully be able to help you out with any questions before your next exam. So uh, for those of you who need a little bit of a refresher on how um, HIV infects the cell and completes its natural life cycle, there is a video that is quite helpful, and it's only about five minutes, so it's, it's actually worth it because it will actually show you, too, how to use the different medications and where they fit into the life cycle. And for those of you who are really interested in mechanisms of action, I found a video from Khan Academy that describes the different types of medications and their mechanisms and where they work in the cell as well. So the different medications that we do use are broken down into classes, and we will work on each of these classes individually. Um, if you are curious right now, the guidelines do suggest that we use nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and we'll wind up using two of those plus another drug. And right now, the preferred third drug is an integrase inhibitor or an integrase strand transfer inhibitor. We will talk about the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and protease inhibitors, and we'll also talk about some of the entry inhibitors but something to keep in mind as we start to go forward is that you may have heard the term HART, H-A-A-R-T, which stands for Highly Active Antiretroviral Agents. Um, though that term is kind of outdated in that currently all of the different medication regimens we could use are considered highly effective or highly active. So we've uh, changed the term to combination antiretroviral agents, CART, or even just antiretroviral therapy, which is just ART. Um, so if you do notice some, some literature describing heart, do you know that that's not any different than what we're talking about today? It's just different medications. So sadly, there are not a lot of tricks to help remember um, the different drugs and what class these drugs belong to. Uh, but as examples of some that might be helpful, any drug that ends in NAVIR is a protease inhibitor. The GRAVIRs are integrase inhibitors. The virine drugs, V-I-R-I-N-E, are second generation or newer NNRTIs. And the reason that they're considered newer and second generation is that uh, many of these new ones have fewer side effects and or um, drug interactions, so they're a little bit easier to use. And then the Viroc drug is the CCR5 antagonist. Right now there's only one, uh, which is Mareviroc, but uh, studies are looking at other Viroc drugs for different medical conditions. And you're kind of on your own for trying to memorize which of the NRTIs or the first generation NNRTIs are used, but we will talk about the ones I want you to remember and uh, just kind of think about those ones as the ones you need to memorize. So like I said, our rule is currently to uh, do two NRTIs plus one other drug. The ones I'm going to ask you to know as we go forward are the integrase inhibitors and the boosted protease inhibitors. Uh, the reason that they're boosted is that there is a, a low dose of another drug, ritonavir or cobicistat, that inhibits the um, metabolism of the active protease inhibitor. And that actually means that you can take lower doses, but you can also take it fewer amounts of time during the day. And that's a great thing until you start throwing a bunch of other drugs on board. Um, the reason that's a problem is that these inhibitors also impact other drugs they're taking and can cause issues when polypharmacy is noted. We will talk a little bit about the NNRTIs and the um, entry inhibitors, but right now they're not approved for treatment-naive patients, or they're not preferred for treatment-naive patients. And one thing that I will throw up is that I never want somebody to use a drug that has a low genetic barrier to resistance by itself. Low genetic barriers to resistance um, mean that if you take a drug and e you miss even a couple of doses, it very quickly is a drug that you are resistant to. Um, so some examples are some of the drugs that we're going to be talking about today, uh, but then 
what's nice is the current regimens are all made of high genetic barrier resistance drugs, which means even though we don't want to tell our patients to stop taking medications or to miss doses, on that off chance that life happens and they do, um, there's less of a chance that they're going to become resistant because of one or two missed doses. So why do we use three drugs when we are using a regimen to treat HIV? Um, the idea is that we want to hit it from a bunch of different angles because HIV is a very smart virus. Um, the virus has high rates of replication and is, um, is kind of prone to errors because reverse transcriptase doesn't have proofreading ability. Mutations are pretty common in the presence of one or two missed drugs or even missed doses. Um, so we do want to make sure that uh, we're hitting it from as many angles as we can. And what's the clinical significance of these mutations? Just like with other resistance to say antibiotics or um, cancer chemotherapies, um, if you are resistant to a drug, it no longer works. And one problem with this is that mutations for HIV medications are for life. They may not show up necessarily on the resistance testing that we do, but they can actually hide inside the sanctuary sites of the body. So um, in the, the central nervous system or in the genitals tract or even in the bones, um, these mutations can actually hide until you stop taking the drug or start taking the drug. And because it's seen these drugs, it actually comes back with a vengeance and the medications don't work. Um, and like I said before, when HIV is not challenged with a drug, that type of virus will actually replicate faster than those that are challenged or that have a mutation. So wait, if you were looking at the um, preferred guidelines in the, the table that I gave you earlier, you did see a couple of two drug regimens on there. And what do we do about those? Um, so there are a couple that are FDA approved. One of them is the combination of ropivirine and dolutegravir, which is for treatment experience patients who have been stabilized and undetectable on a three drug regimen. And then there's one that is the combination of dolutegravir and lamivudine that is only for treatment naive patients who have no resistance to either of those drugs. Other examples are used off label. As examples, there are people who have used protease inhibitors with lamivudine or protease inhibitors with m um, but they are off label and they are definitely not first line, but they can be used in certain circumstances. In the United States, the only kind of preferred circumstance for use of two drug regimens are when there's a concern about long-term side effects related to either tenofovir or abacavir. And we'll talk more about these drugs in a bit, but do know that those are renal or cardiovascular concerns or when there's a concern about drug interactions. Sometimes fewer drugs is better just because it is going to have less of a, a chance of drug interactions. Now, when should these not ever be used? Uh, first off, we're not going to use these combinations in women who have childbearing potential. And one of the reasons for that is that dolutegravir is a drug that could potentially cause neuro tube defects. Um, but there's also concern that if a woman were to become pregnant on this medication during the third trimester of pregnancy, when the volume of distribution increases, we need more of the drug. So we would have to actually take a different drug to keep the levels high. Um, so dolutegravir is off the table in uh, women who are, uh, who are potentially trying to become pregnant or could potentially become pregnant. There's also concern about drug resistance. And while this is rare, we have to consider the example of dolutegravir and lamivudine. Um, when you're talking about that specific drug combination, uh, there are a number of people who in the past have been exposed to lamivudine and might be resistant to it. And in those cases, you wouldn't want to use dolutegravir and lamivudine because by default, it's like you're using just dolutegravir by itself. Um, another concern is with hepatitis B co-infection. You have to have on board, if somebody is HIV and hepatitis B co-infected, two drugs that are effective against hepatitis B. And while one of them is lamivudine, um, you do need another drug on board, and that drug is usually going to be tenofovir. So step one, what are the rules of the NRTIs? One of three options are typically used, um, and using a combination product is going to reduce pill burden. So as um, just kind of a, a heads up, anytime I have a forward slash between two drugs, it means that they're combined into one pill. Um, so the four examples that we have currently are tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate with emtricitabine, tenofovir alafenamide with emtricitabine, tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate with lamivudine, and abacavir with lamivudine. And like I said, if you take one of these, it's basically two drugs in one, which is going to reduce pill burden. 
But I do want you to note that none of these are single tablet regimens. And when I say single tablet regimens, I mean that all of the drugs that a person needs to take for this condition are in one pill. And with each of these combinations, you need to add a third agent. And one other kind of example that comes up is, um, I, I wanna make sure that you're all aware of the fact that you never wanna use two NRTIs that, have this, that are analogs of the same nucleotide. And as a really good example, a lot of times when I'm going through this information for a class, they often wonder about using two of the drugs, lamivudine and emtricitabine together. Uh, we don't wanna do that because they are both analogs of the same um, nucleotide, cytosine. So basically it's like you're using one drug instead of two. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So how do you select your antiretrovirals? Um, when it comes to the NRTIs, this is going to be based on renal function. Uh, for somebody who has low renal function or there's concern about renal function failing, we don't want to use tenofovir because it can cause acute issues and Fanconi syndrome. All of the NRTIs do require dosing adjustments in renal dysfunction with the exception of abacavir. Um, and as kind of a, an aside, just because it has come up before, when you're using zidovudine in children, that doesn't get adjusted until the creatinine clearance falls below 15. Um, a bag of beer does not get dose adjusted at all, so it's great for people on hemodialysis, and all the rest of the NRTIs start to get dose adjusted at between 50 and 30 um, milliliters per minute. We also have to look at the HLA B5701. Uh, if they are positive for that um, allele, a bacavir shouldn't be used because it does increase the likelihood that they're going to have a hypersensitivity reaction to the drug. Something to keep in mind is that even if that is negative, there is a very, very small chance that a person could have a hypersensitivity. And if they're negative, um, we will still potentially challenge because it is such a rare likelihood that they're going to have the hypersensitivity. But if it's positive, that's put in their, the patient's allergies, and they're never given a drug that has a bacavir in it. We also have to look at the hepatitis B diagnosis. And um, when we're talking about hepatitis B, we do need two drugs on board that will cover for both. One of those is always going to be some form of tenofovir, be it DF or AF formulations, with another one of those drugs. So usually uh, we're going to see emtricitabine as the second drug, but some people might throw lamivudine on instead. Uh, we're going to base it on viral load. So there are some drugs that we'll talk about over the next couple of uh, of minutes and next couple of modules about drugs that shouldn't be used with high viral loads. One of those is the combination of abacavir and lamivudine. The one exception to that is when you're using it with dolutegravir, which is a good thing because abacavir, lamivudine, and dolutegravir does come as a single tablet regimen, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you ever see a combination of abacavir and lamivudine with another drug and the patient has a high viral load, it shouldn't be recommended. We also look at cardiovascular disease. Um, abacavir could potentially um, increase the risk of cardiovascular events such as myocardial infarction or stroke. We also have to look at their osteoporosis risk because tenofovir can actually increase the demineralization of bones. And like I said before, the tenofovir DF is going to be much more likely to do that than the uh, tenofovir AF. Rarely we think about the, um, the heavy use of and the chronic use of alcohol. Abacavir is metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase, so there is some concern that um, you may increase abacavir adverse events if you are using with um, high levels of alcohol. And obviously we want to use something that's once daily, and the drugs that we talked about on the other slide are, but zidobutene will end up being twice daily for our, our kids. Um, we want to avoid side effects, and the drugs that we talked about before are pretty um, benign in terms of side effects. But we also want to remember that we should be using single tablet regimens. And um, when we have that ability, which I'll show you in a couple of slides, we will use those as our options. So the first NRTI that we're going to talk about is Abacavir. Again, this is the only one that doesn't require dose adjustment in renal dysfunction, and it should be used with viral loads that are less than 100,000 unless it's used with Zolutegravir. There is some concern that over the last couple of years, a number of retrospective studies have looked at the, um, the risk and the likelihood of HIV medications causing cardiovascular events or being associated with cardiovascular events. In looking at the data backwards, it does seem to suggest that abacavir might play a role in increasing um, 
cardiovascular um, events. But something to keep in mind is um, you can cut, you can look at studies backwards and you can find confirmation to whatever your concerns are. So this is pretty controversial. And when it comes to the choice, what I would say is that if a person does have cardiovascular risk and you have other drugs that are available to treat it, it's not a bad idea to use those other drugs. Uh, but if you have cardiovascular risk and there is no other option and you have to use a Bacavir or they're not being treated, it's better to use a Bacavir than to not use it. The risk is much less than the benefit would potentially be. And when it comes to cardiovascular issues, also consider the fact that uh, most of our patients will end up being smokers. And the one single best thing we could do with the, uh, the possible exception of eating appropriately and doing exercise is to decrease your smoking risk. Uh, we talked a little bit about that hypersensitivity reaction with Abacavir, which is seen in about four to eight percent of people. Typically, this is going to start with symptoms like fever or constitutional symptoms. Uh, then it will kind of progress to GI issues. Rash tends to be a pretty late symptom, so I think oftentimes we think of hypersensitivity as causing rash, but that isn't always the case with Abacavir. And the real concern about this is that this could end up being multi-system and fatal, and with continued use of the drug, in the presence of um, the hypersensitivity, they can usually cause um, cardiovascular or um, respiratory collapse and patients can die. It's worse with continued use of the medication and the way that we try and prevent that is by doing that HLA B701 test. If we do that test, the likelihood is about 60% that they are going to have a, a hypersensitivity. So we are never gonna challenge them. That does go in the allergy uh, for the patient. If it's negative, it still could potentially happen, but it's less than 2% that it does. So we are going to uh, just make sure that patients are aware of those symptoms. And what are those symptoms? They are listed on this Abacavir warning card. And if any of you have dispensed antiretroviral medications before, they tend to come in bottles, but the bottles come in boxes. And on the side of the box, there is a little credit card shaped um, piece of kind of a fold that gives you this information that's listed here. And if you get a symptom from two or more of the following groups while taking this medication or any medication that has a back of beer in it, you wanna call your doctor right away to determine whether or not you should stop taking the medicine. Um, the last thing somebody wants to do is to have a fever that's related to influenza and just automatically stop taking this medication. So always touching base with your doctor or pharmacist is probably a good idea. And one of the concerns is that if you start to notice that you're having some of these symptoms, um, within hours, this could wind up being life-threatening. So you do want to make sure you're talking to your doctor or you've got your pharmacist on speed dial just in case. Another drug is this tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate. Uh, this is one of the two prodrugs of tenofovir that we use in practice. And while tenofovir is active inside the cell, we don't have a way to get tenofovir from the mouth to the cell without it being destroyed. So we have to have these prodrugs to get into the system. With tenofovir disaproxyl fumarate, you do need to consider using these cautiously in patients who have any risk factor for or have any history of renal impairment. Um, this would include uncontrolled diabetes or um, uncontrolled blood pressure, but also the use of other nephrotoxic drugs. So we tend to think about things like vancomycin or the um, aminoglycosides, but one of the most common concerns that we have on an outpatient basis is the use of high-dose NSAIDs, particularly when we're using them with um, ACE inhibitors. So we all know about the drug interaction between ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs, but when you throw tenofovir on top of that, we've had members in our, um, in our clinical practice that have wound up on hemodialysis because they, um, they were given the aminoglycoside, or rather, they were given the ACE inhibitor, they were given the tenofovir, and they wound up spraining their wrist or their back or they had a headache um, and so they took over-the-counter ibuprofen and it put them into renal failure so they wound up on dialysis. Um, other concerns are that this medication can decrease bone mineral density so if a person has risk factors for osteopenia or osteoporosis um, they are older, they are uh, skinny, they are Asian, they are smokers, they are women, um, a lot of those things could potentially play a role in deciding whether or not to use these medications. And one of the concerns from a patient standpoint is the risk of GI complaints. So you can actually take this medication with or without food, but if you take it with food, it can actually stop some of the GI issues. Um, one of the other things I would recommend is that you take it at night before you go to bed, 
because that way you're sleeping through most of your GI concerns and you wake up in the morning and they're gone. So tenofovir prodrugs are the only two drugs that are approved for prevention, um, and we'll talk about the other one in just a second. So tenofovir elefenamide um, is a different prodrug, and as you can see on this picture, it's actually a better prodrug at getting the tenofovir inside the cell where it's effective against HIV. Um, with tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, much of the tenofovir is outside of the cell, and it has to be taken into something, so it winds up being taken into the bone or the kidneys where it causes all of its problems. When you're using tenofovir elefenamide, you can use a lower dose because most of it gets into the cell, and there's a much smaller amount left in the plasma to uh, impact bone or kidney function. And just so that everybody is on the same page about the renal function, um, when you're talking about tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, tenofovir elefenamide, and abacavir, I do expect that you might know these cutoffs. Uh, the DF is usually at about 50 mLs per minute where you have to start dosing it differently. Tenofovir elefenamide can be used until about 30 mLs per minute. And again, a back of ear is not renally dose adjusted. So the other drugs that I think are important to recognize are m and lamivudine. And I've brought these up a couple of times because they are very potent and are often used with somebody who is treatment naive and they're pretty well tolerated. So when it comes to adverse events, usually lamivudine can cause some headache. And the one concern about m is that on occasion it can cause a skin hyperpigmentation on the palms and the soles. This is more genetic or genetic. This is more um, cosmetic than anything. And if there is concern about darkening of the skin on the palms and soles, you stop the m and it tends to go away. Uh, these two drugs are identical in action, which is why they're kind of listed together, and they have similar resistance profiles. And if you do get the resistance mutation because you've missed one of these drugs um, for a couple of times, the 184B mutation, you are resistant to both of those drugs. Um, and because these are both used in combinations, that tends to make it a little bit easier for other um, the use of these medications. So one of these is almost always going to be on board in a treatment-naive person, and since tenofovir DF and tenofovir AF are combined with emtricitabine, it's a good bet that if you are going through the list and I give you a patient case and you find that somebody should be using a bacavir, um, they should probably also be using lamivudine because it's combined. Um, the other thing would be if they have some sort of reason that they should be on tenofovir or they can't use a bacavir, if you're using tenofovir, you're going to combine it with emtricitabine. And like I had mentioned before, tenofovir, amtricitabine, and um, lamivudine are all active against hepatitis B. And a kind of mnemonic that a friend of mine had come up with in regards to these medications is the old Beatles song, Let It Be. Um, Let It Be is the three drugs that are effective against hepatitis B, lamivudine, amtricitabine, and tenofovir. Other NRTIs, just so that you've got them, are listed here. Um, there is some information that uh, you should be expected to know for your licensing examinations, but none of these will be on the exam for um, this class. These are drugs that are not used anymore, but um, because they are, they are special in terms of their, their side effects and how they're dosed, um, oftentimes they will show up on your licensing examinations. So when you're ready for those and when you're ready to study, this information is available.